Um, as we mentioned in terms of some of the background, um, I physically am a professor at the University of Northern Iowa, so I apologize for all the Iowa State guard behind us. But as, as noted, I did my PhD, actually three of my four degrees are from Iowa State. So I have a kind of purple and gold exterior most of the time, and then I bleed cardinal and gold. I'm very well uh, aligned with our board of regent schools. I have no hard feelings against Iowa either. So all three schools are excellent, excellent institutions. Um, and just in terms of a little bit of additional background here um, in terms of myself. Uh, Kylie mentioned that I obviously hold a tenured appointment in the Department of Management at UNI. The PFC Services is actually a boutique consultancy that the, essentially the principals are myself and my father. Um, he's a former CFO. I'm an industrial engineer turned professor. And uh, we, we work pretty well together in general. So it's, it's always an interesting dynamic when it's a father-son combination like this. Uh, and in, in general, uh, probably the most interesting uh, conversations we have is when my father actually reports to me on more academic or my lead projects. And a lot of times our organizations have a hard time with that concept that uh, we, we really do split things um, in terms of the uh, workload and the type of work that we're doing. A couple of other just kind of tangential pieces here, hold some visiting appointments at the University of Missouri where I held the faculty appointment before I came to, back to Iowa and as well as at uh, Seattle, in Seattle at Washington. Uh, lots of publication stuff that we could talk about if anyone's interested after the fact. Um, I do have one polling question, and because of the changeover in the type of configuration for host versus non-host, I think the easiest way to probably do this, instead of trying to do a poll for timing, um, why don't you go ahead and just give a thumbs up if you go to reactions, depending on what, I think the way your panels are set up, you can do reactions and then you can do like a thumbs up sort of thing, and then I can see from the participants list who gives me a thumbs up. So first question here, we're gonna talk a little bit about Six Sigma and industrial statistics. Um, have you ever heard of Six Sigma? So give me a thumbs up if you've never heard of Six Sigma in your reaction. I'm guessing most of us have at least heard of Six Sigma. Okay, next one, who's had a little bit of exposure to Six Sigma but hasn't had any like certification training or anything like that? So we've heard of Six Sigma but we haven't done any training in it. I don't see any thumbs up, so I'm not sure if that means everyone. So let's go on to the next one to see if the thumbs even work. Um, how about we had a little bit of uh, certification or training on the area? And maybe I can't view these for some reason, which would be odd, but. Huh, Kylie, I don't know if you can see the thumbs on there, but uh, usually this works, so I'm not sure why I don't have yes, any thumbs. Yes, you got quite a few thumbs up on the first okay. and second question and no thumbs up on the certifi uh, certification. Um, okay, that was what I expected. Okay, so that's good. Um, so that's helpful in terms of just kind of knowing audience-wise what we're getting into. And I'm gonna delineate a little bit about what the difference is between lean versus Six Sigma versus applied and industrial statistics, because they're all very different things. But a lot of times people get, overwhelmed when you get into operational excellence, continuous improvement, industrial engineering, with all these different terminologies. And um, of course, as you see in my bottom question there, you know, have you been certified at a white, yellow, green, black belt, master black belt level? We use these kind of karate, taekwondo, black belt uh, certification levels to kind of show how much skill and experience we have in those areas. Um, if you think about some of the different types of skills that we want to have our team members equipped with, generally speaking, uh, continuous improvement methodologies are very, very useful for us. So if you look at some of the top in-demand job skills, Six Sigma project management are actually two of the top five most in-demand job skills in the United States. Um, so very, very interesting in terms of how those have become so prevalent. I know as a young engineer in training, so to speak, um, a lot of my professors said, oh, this Six Sigma thing's a fad. It's going to go away eventually. And uh, basically, I do it every single day of my life still, um, many, many years later. So whether I'm doing it in an industry training environment, I'm certifying uh, students, undergrads and grad students at the universities, it is a, a nonstop event uh, in terms of some of the, the programs that we do in that area. And then through Kirkwood, doing various training on these Six Sigma apply statistics supply chain tend to be some of the common areas there. So today I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a brief overview of some of these areas and some of the more kind of in-demand uh, areas within or sub-areas within. So we've got this certification process. And just to give you a little bit of background, 
And if anyone wants more details, I've got kind of a short write up of how I define these things. One of the things you'll notice about all these belts is that there isn't one end all be all certification entity. A lot of people go back to ASQ, the American Society for Quality, because they're one of the kind of preeminent professional organizations in this space and they do some online and in-person types of training, at least pre-COVID. Um, and I've built a lot of my programs along some of the fun foundational fundamentals of ASQ's programs. In fact, I typically use their yellow, green, and black belt handbooks as a lot of my training guides and manuals and kind of as a complement to my own materials. Um, so we have custom PFC um, and other partner programs like Kirkwood programs in these areas that we do. A lot of the stuff we do is very customized and tailored. Um, for example, I, I almost always have a cohort going with Target Distribution in Cedar Falls. Um, I had one just wrap up and I have another one starting up here again in a couple of weeks. Uh, there's a lot of demand for these skills within that distribution center operations. Uh, so if you think about what these actually mean, white belt is generally like a, could be two, four, six, eight hour class, kind of an overview. You kind of understand and learn a little bit about what lean and six sigma are and what they mean. And generally you might, may or may not get a white belt. A lot of times they're not actual certification programs. It's kind of like we did training class for, a day or a week, and now I kind of know what it is. Yellow belt is one, and green belts are some of the entry level certifications. And the way that I define them is both have a classroom component, a certification exam, and some sort of either simulated or live client project. So, what I've been doing, especially post COVID here or in the midst of COVID, I've created a simulated yellow belt program, which I had done before, but I really beefed it up during COVID times because there was so much demand for these kind of like online synchronous, asynchronous training programs. So we have a yellow belt that we've been running um, cohorts through for the last year plus, um, where you do a simulated project that I created in an online environment based on real world stuff, but it's all online. The green belts I delineate, my me personally and PFC and you and I Advance Iowa and others delineate by having a live client project. So think about your team members at the organization doing a live client project under my supervision, mentorship and guidance. That's where that one fits in. And then the black belts generally are very involved projects that would be higher level, bigger time and cost savings, as well as more statistical rigor in the analysis, which we're getting to here in a second. So that's just kind of the way. And then, of course, you've got executive black belts and things of that nature uh, at different levels as well. So first, when you think about Lean and Six Sigma, one of the reasons a lot of people get hung up on Six Sigma is if they don't have a background in statistics, industrial engineering, operations management, they oftentimes get bogged down in statistics, right? Statistics was that class we all took as undergrads. Maybe we didn't like it very much, but now we've seen the power of statistics over our careers and over our lives. It's data analytics this, data analytics that. Um, how do we build out dashboards to analyze situations and drive decision-making? Um, just, I mean, you go straight up to Wikipedia or dictionary.com. Um, we're trying to analyze and decipher between descriptive statistics where we can take a look at some of the overwhelming, kind of overarching, uh, features of a data set, and then inferential statistics where we really drive decisions off of that, right? We're making inferences on things that we're seeing. So it's, it's really not as complex as people make it out to be. Where most people get hung up is on hypothesis testing and things of that nature. Um, and oftentimes, one of the biggest delineators for an industry group like yours versus academics is what I call practical and industry statistical significance versus academic statistical significance. So when I'm writing all those you know, 40 plus research papers, they wanna see statistical significance and statistical findings, right? The academics want, we wanna prove our results against our hypotheses. In industry, most management teams don't really care about that. They care about saving time and making money. So we get into what I call practical and applied statistics, which is a little bit different ball game. And there is some overlap between both. So it's just some more definitions here in terms of the differences between uh, statistics, I, of course, like any good professor, have cited myself here with one of my former students. Um, so you get into these different ways that we really collect, analyze, and drive decisions off of statistics, right? So that's really what we're trying to accomplish in all of this. The purpose, we get bogged down too much in, you know, spreadsheets and numbers. Um, one of my common pet peeves with all of this is that everyone wants to talk about Microsoft Excel, and we do Excel training. We do um, R, statistical software language training. We do uh, jump and SAS and SPSS, Tableau, right? We've heard all these different systems. These are software systems to help analyze and visualize data and statistics. They are not alone statistic. I mean, there, it's, statistics is not Excel, right? Excel is a software package that we can run descriptive statistics off of. We can use some inferential statistical analysis with, 
So that's one of the big things that comes up is we just, everyone gets dumped into Excel. I saw a kind of a cool chart, maybe I'll, if anyone's interested, send it later, where it shows like, especially in engineering, we do a lot of calculus and integral differentiation, things like this. Then we kind of go through this curve and suddenly everyone just uses Excel for everything. Um, it's kind of a weird way that we do this. We use these sophisticated systems, but the general idea is that we're trying to drive better decision-making through our teams. Here's just a quick kind of screenshot of some of the types of descriptive statistics you could pull in Excel, just to give you guys a feel. Um, and if you've never used it, uh, kind of one of the quintessential tools to use is the data analysis toolkit. Very easy to train and use on. Um, simply, you have, but you have to add it into Excel and use some of the various simple, it'll generate a lot of these descriptive for, statistics for you immediately. Stuff that you guys may remember from classes, um, mean, standard errors, median modes, all of these different uh, sorts of things, the range, the difference between the max and the min. Uh, so it can quickly put all that together. And a lot of times, even in your banner across the bottom in Excel, it'll give you that stuff right straight away, right? It'll give you those sorts of results, but a very easy sort of add-in. I mentioned some more sophisticated data visualization. So here we've got some Tableau uh, charts going on in terms of a con control chart, a heat map, some uh, histogram frequency sort of analysis stuff going on here. So there's a lot more sophisticated ways that we can do data analysis within other software packages. Um, and again, a lot depends on your appetite. Uh, maybe some of your companies still use Minitab, right? Um, my game, end game here is not to be a software trainer. You can go directly to Tableau or Minitab or uh, whoever you want to for that. Now, Excel, maybe uh, there's a lot of things you can do in Excel. Uh, you could do it all of this. My goal is to, to generally teach what the importance of statistics are and how to use them within your day-to-day -day lives and your workspaces, right? So whether it's at Target, this some of this data is actually from a food and beverage manufacturer. So you look and you say, okay, what's happening here is that top chart, this is actually for things like cooked chicken and beef. And if you're running a food and beverage manufacturer and you have a situation where you get below or above uh, upper and lower control limits, this becomes problematic. So like down here, this could be undercooked content, right? That's problematic. You might actually, the way this works, they have to scrap out so much before and after. I just heard some of the Johnson and Johnson vaccines were defective. And I think some of the Moderna ones. So they have to scrap out those batches before and after so many to make sure they're not sending them out. Um, and so then you get into this whole idea about up here, what happens if you're too high and you overcook, think about on your grill at home, right? We're getting a grill in season. You overcook that stuff, then it dries it out, right? It doesn't taste as good. It, it actually also costs money to a food manufacturer because they lose what they call the drip loss, all that moisture within the product. So that becomes problematic to be above or below this. Above it, you're probably not, you're not gonna get sick from it. It's not gonna taste as good and you might complain about the quality of it. Below it, it's a health and safety issue. So you've gotta really identify what is the, the target area and where are we at. Um, in this case, just looking at the heat map, I can kind of quickly see that what's happening here is that they're, in this particular data set, they're probably overcooking more of it just to be on the safe side. Um, so that they don't have things going out that are uh, dangerous for consumers. A little bit, so that was kind of just an overview about statistics. Now, Six Sigma is an applied project management use of statistics. So if you look at my bottom bullet there, statistically, it's a process that only has 3.4 defects out of a million opportunities, meaning any process, any whether it's manufacturing, service industry, doesn't matter. If you're producing something, kind of like running a million flights, right? You want a million flights for United or Delta or American, you want to have zero crashes, right? That's a six sigma level of quality. But what it's really about is about reducing variation. So when I cook that piece of chicken, that it is exactly the target value, whatever that target is. I think we said the target was maybe the 79, right? It is exactly 79 every time. So there's not an 85 or a 78, right? That would be a six sigma level of uh, quality when we get to that 3.4 defects per million opportunity. Now, from the business standpoint, what it's become is it's become a project management framework where you use a five-step approach, the kind of academic textbook definition of which is DMAIC, define, measure, analyze, improve, control. So when I say textbook, almost every company I work with has their own spin on this, right? Um, they've got eight-step approaches. They use DMEDI, which is a, another acronym like DMAIC. Um, I worked for one of the original sort of companies in industry, a Say Brown Bavaria ABB, we did Six Sigma, then we went to something we called 4Q, then we went back to Six Sigma. So a lot of times it kind of depends on who your vice president of operations or who your uh, chief operating officer is, kind of what direction you go, the way you do this. But generally speaking, you use some combination of reducing variation with Six Sigma and some combination of reducing waste, which is what lean is about, right? Sorry, I 
minus that past that. So again, just kind of what that's looking like statistically, if you think about your normal curve and sigma being so many standard deviations away from that. So if you get within the upper and lower bounds here, everything would fall within here other than a few defects. So very, very high level of quality. Most people ask me, so generally speaking, what level are the consulting clients you walk into or the research companies you walk in? Generally speaking, no one is even close to this, right? That's why I'm there and my students are there working on these projects to try to improve them. Uh, originally developed by a team of consultants at Motorola and some faculty, later faculty at schools like Villanova and Arizona State, and then enhanced in industry by Honeywell, GE, ABB, others. Uh, GE really made it famous. If you guys have studied, I know we've talked a lot so far since I've been on at least about strategy and some of the other side of the management uh, discipline. Uh, Jack Welch, uh, CEO of GE during one of their kind of heydays, uh, he was a huge proponent of Six Sigma. So when investors and analysts would ask, Jack, what did you do? How did you turn GE around? How has it become so great? He would say Six Sigma and they'd be like, what the heck is that? Um, so very, very disciplined approach using those five steps. What ends up happening is in most of your jobs in your lives, you get into the situation where someone will come to you whining and complaining about something. Oh, this is a big problem. This is a big problem. But we don't have the data to support that. So in Six Sigma methodology, what we call that is the trivial many things that come up in our lives that lead to variance and quality defects and issues. In reality, usually only a few of those things actually matter. And that's why we have to do root cause analysis and get into data. Um, I could talk about this all day. I only have a couple minutes left. But um, I'll, uh, one story I like to tell, because I get cornered all the time by executives. They take me on the dog and pony show tour of the facility. Then two seconds later, they say, how can we fix all this stuff? And I always have to be honest, say, I, I can make guesses. I'll make guesses all day long, but I, I cannot guarantee this is what it is. We had a situation like that in Europe once. We were, I take a lot of students to Europe to these projects. It's a desirable location, right, for the students to get some ex international experience. Where I got cornered by this factory owner. It was actually in Ireland, a German-owned company later. I said, oh, you know, our operator, what's going on here? And it, what was happening was they had essentially dog treats and bones that were cracking. I won't get into all the details. And they said, why? And I said, uh, best guess is this is kind of open air in part. So probably the ambient temperature and humidity. Think about your house, right? Open air. It's that springtime of season. We're not running AC and heat anymore. The HVAC equipment. So that's probably it. Well, it turned out we were completely wrong. When the students collected the data and analyzed it, it was because they were shorting one recipe ingredient that ended up having a binder within it. And they were cracking because of that. We also thought maybe truck transit, G4 stuff. Nope, wrong. We were guessing, right? We're, there's all these variables, but the one that it actually was, was the recipe and shorting one part of the ingredient. So that's a great RCA, root cause analysis sort of example. I said the difference here, variation reduction versus waste elimination. That's really the big, and a lot of people don't really understand the difference between the two, which is why you get into what they call LSS, Lean Six Sigma, or TLS, which is Theory of Constraints, which I won't have time to get into today, Lean and Six Sigma. So all slightly, so you have these kind of overlap between the continuous improvement processes. So just kind of showing side by side some of the difference between them. But again, if nothing else from this session, remember Lean's about eliminating waste and non-value add, and Six Sigma is about reducing variation and looking at some of the more statistical side of this. Uh, last thing I think I got here, 5S, if you guys have heard of this. I spent a lot of time talking with some students and clients about 5S yesterday. Um, so a place for everything, everything in its place, order, cleanliness, that's also a big part of this, especially if you think about waste and variance and processes. A lot of times that waste and variance is coming from disorder and chaos and not having things in their places. Uh, this is just a snapshot of some of the companies we work with uh, in Europe uh, in particular. I've been going to Ireland for a decade now doing these kind of projects. Of course, all my students want to work at Guinness for some reason. I don't understand why that is, but uh, actually I want to be at Guinness too. It's one of my favorite places. But uh, So again, my contact info, and I think Kylie said she sent out uh, some materials for you guys to get in touch with uh, me and the Kirkwood group, but that is the end of my spiel here. I think I'm like right at time. So thank you guys.